I'm sitting in a large park in Sacramento. There are ducks and many trees and ponds with water fountains. Across from me is a hole of a golf course. People walk or jog by, some watching the ducks or the golfers, others headed to a nearby zoo. It's pretty early, 10 a.m. or so. I spent the night at Scott Bybee's grandparents' house in one of the suburban towns, just outside the capital. Austin and I drive up yesterday in his old yellow squareback Volkswagen. There's no radio or air conditioning. We sing pop songs and play 20 questions. A few miles from our destination, we're pulled over by a highway patrol near to the town of Lodi. An officer comes to the passenger's window while we sit on the I-5, cars tumbling past. He wonders if we've been drinking, because there was some swerving a ways back. No. The car's old, and we can't get up to normal speed limit very often. As a consequence, cars fly past, shaking the square back and causing minor swerving. After handing Austin his license back, the officer returns to his squad car. But the car won't start. So eventually, the patrol car push starts us. We arrive about midnight. Scott makes tea for, for all of us, but Austin goes right to sleep. Lights on and everything. Scott's cup doesn't have a handle, and he drinks it with an oven mitt before changing cups. When I get into bed, the air conditioning is pretty loud, but I'm tired and some earplugs help me get to sleep. At 9 a.m. or so, I come into the kitchen and meet Scott's grandfather, Harvey, and his great-uncle, Jim. Harvey discusses, discusses the usual things with us for a bit, and after I mention that I plan to study philosophy, he goes into his own. After some talk, he turns to you and says, Life is really wonderful. He says this with intensity and warmth. You eat cinnamon rolls and dress. You and Scott drive into town. Scott plans to attend an orientation at the Sacramento Zoo for volunteering. You both walk to the gates and ask for the location of the meeting. Scott's a bit dazed, but pleasant and intelligent. He heads into the to the zoo and you walk around a bit before sitting down beside a large public pond. It's soft, and you notice the health of not being moved to do or please. You'd thought to jog, but made a decision not to, arguing that a bike ride would suit you later. It's really nice here. The next day is Austin's birthday. You guys drive to San Francisco and get there about 1 p.m. Meshugana and Crick smoke pod and take psychedelic mushrooms throughout the day. You drive Scott's car. You park in a fancy structure, some kind of elite parking, and at the top of the structure is a small hangout spot with flowers and chairs. They buy beer at a liquor store a few streets off the freeway and chug them in the parking garage. You and Austin eventually pee in this garage. There's a lot of significant peeing throughout the day. You walk throughout Chinatown, looking into the little shops, and eventually you meet some homeless people. You do some doo-wop with some of these people, you buy some oolong tea, you eat at a good Italian restaurant. There's, this waiter has a tremendous persona. You have soup, some salad, a beer, and a coffee. Austin goes off and dances while you're eating this Italian food. Later we walk past a bar and a musician waves to him knowingly. You intend to walk to Hayton Ashbury. You meet some more homeless people, some very dispiriting. This fellow attempts to sell us a vial of acid, and after we refuse, he asks us what we intend to be doing today. We tell him which, where we're trying to get, and immediately he tells us to get on this bus. We jump on the back of it and ride it a ways. Scott finds this very amusing and comes back to it throughout the day. Riding on the bus, there's many attractive women. Actually, throughout the entire adventure, you notice a lot of attractive women. You had a dream the night before about running into a whole bunch of old classmates and friends. During this dream, you run into an old crush of yours, Vanessa. She starts saying sorry to you. You long again and again throughout the day to put your face against hers, to talk softly. On the bus ride, you think about not falling off. All this drug use is so mechanical. Such immediate gratification and desperation. The bus finally gets us to Hate Street, and you walk to the park. You listen to this jam session with a whole bunch of hippies. You pee on a tree. Drug dealers offer you a whole bunch of things. Eventually, you make a sketch on how to get back to the parking structure. 
you go into this big supermarket to buy some water. These European clothed fellows drop a beer and it shatters. You get back on the bus. You sit next to a very attractive girl. She's soft, not cold and rejecting. You want to talk to her, but don't. Just one beer a day, you think, at most. With a meal or something, maybe before you go to sleep. No, just with a meal. Or maybe not. Maybe if you go out, that's okay. You get to Market Street, and there's lots of walking. When you get back to the parking garage, it's closed. Eventually, when you get there, you can't find the parking pass. These people have to take a copy of your license. You drive back to Scott's house. You're tired. You're hungry. The next morning, Harvey talks to you some more. He says, attitude is altitude. You think about this guy you met in the middle of San Francisco. This guy's name was Clouds, from Chicago or something. Even amidst all the hustle and bustle and all the desperation of the homeless, Clouds seem to have a good attitude. Harvey says, the day starts before you get to sleep.